This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of No Other Pod. I'm Jimmy, along with my good buddy Daniel Guzer. Dan, mm. what's going on, my friend? What's going on, indeed, man? It's uh, been a weekend. My show closed up. We're all done. Moving on to the next one. And yeah. Uh, I was I, I did not get to watch this game live last night. Uh, it sounds like I didn't miss a whole lot. Uh, and happy Father's Day to everyone out there. Yeah. And uh, especially to those people, I think it's worth mentioning to those people who do not have a father anymore or never, yes. never did or, you know, love to you as well. You know, absolutely. However, however you're impacted. Yeah. Can be a great day for some people. It can be a tough day for some people. So that's why I fucking hate holidays sometimes, man, because I'm like, there is a. a pretty big consensus of people that are not having a great day yeah. and it's like why do we even do this yeah you know money <laughs> yeah <laughs> essentially yeah yeah but uh but yeah no for to to anybody out there however it's impacting you um you know hope it's either a, a good day or or a safe day or a, a healing day or whatever you need so yeah um in, yeah in terms of this game it got it got real weird especially in the second half um it, it was i can't say it was an enjoyable experience uh yeah. but it got very sort of mls after darky uh at, at times um and and there were some some quotes again from peter uh that leave you believing that he's not happy with with people and it's at this point i mean feature not a bug welcome to 2024 sporting kansas city team this is how it's going to be for the remainder of the year and we will do our best to, t- to talk about it but it's not always going to be fun and that's a bummer but bro have you ever worked with someone where you're like i can't believe that person makes that much money for the workload that they do like that's crazy and then you kind of look at how much a lot of these guys get paid over everybody else that's like kind of putting numbers on the board whether it's assists or or goals i remember rodriguez is coming in getting assists Mm-hmm. Uh, and Alan Polito's like not scoring. I'm like this man. <laughs> I'm I don't know what to say about it. It's it's unfortunate. It really is. Alan Polito, I think, has been scoreless now in eight goals, eight straight goals. So eight games, you mean? Eight, eight, eight games. I mean, yeah. Sorry, uh, scoreless in eight games. Um, so good for your designated yeah. player striker. Um, I mean, sometimes it looks like he's playing a freaking midfielder, and sometimes he actually is, but. Yeah. Other times when he's supposed to be the striker, he's still in the midfield. I'm like, what are you doing? We well, talk about I, this all the time. Yeah, I do want to talk about that a little bit later because I think Sporting Kansas City may have a striker problem right now. Add it to the list of problems that they have. Uh, but there, there is an issue that 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 is going on there. Uh, before we get too far into it, I do want to say, make sure you leave a five-star rating and review. If you have not yet done so, we appreciate it. We'd read it here on air, and we appreciate you doing that. Um and we're not we're not affiliated with the uh, the team, so I mean I know you might not want to rate the team five stars, but why the hell wouldn't you rate the podcast right. five stars? Exactly. It's obvious. We're it's, we're out here doing our best. Yeah, bro, we're doing our best. We we might we might fold into just talking about wrestling pay per views. I know y'all love that shit. Clash at the castle. <laughs> I can't stop hearing Drew McIntyre's sword unsheathing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a good show. I enjoyed. I enjoyed the yeah, the, the PLE this weekend. I think there's. A, I had fun. There's some questions as to whether Damian Priest actually meant to mess up his knee, get it all twisted in the ropes or not. But uh, oh man, it looked nasty. So we'll say that it's such an experience. I love the CM Punk twist at the end, especially the way the camera lined up with the showing the ref's back. But the you moment know. I saw his Chicago saw Bulls. The- no, I saw the Bulls Jordan one lows. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, dude, he's a Chicago guy. That's CM Punk wearing those Bulls. Jordan. I mean, the second the ref went down, I was like, okay, this is what's happening. And then you saw Crazy. the guy running out, and I was like, yeah, we all know what what's about to happen. Did you see him lean up against a bunch of CM Punk fans with their shirts, and he 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 audibly says, "What a match, huh?" <laughs> you see the uh, the little behind the scenes vignette that they put out on Twitter, where they're like, oh, they how it happened. Out. And so he's it's just CM Punk standing back there in a black, uh, like Under Armour long sleeve shirt, and he's watching the match on the screen. And all of a sudden, you see him like, he like reacts. He looks around. This is assuming when the ref gets injured and knocked out of the ring. He like looks around. 
And he runs over. He's like, Jessica. And he goes to the, the referee. He's like, Jessica, give me your shirt. And she's like, what? And he's like, give me your, he's like, do you have an extra shirt? And she's like, I got this one. And she's like, he like quick grabs it. He goes, I'll give it back. And he's running down the hallway, throw it on. And then you see him run out into the, the, the tunnel area. And that's what it cuts. I thought you were going to tell me she took her shirt off. Like, well, what? for a moment, I thought that's where it was going, the way they, they were framing it. And then he changed, he changed it to, do you have an extra shirt? So <laughs> She's like, I always care one. I'm, I'm a referee. Of course I have extra shirts. Um, Classic. Yeah, it was fun. I bet Johnny watched it. It was in Scotland. It was in Scotland. I thought about that. I was like, I wonder if Johnny's a fan. Because like they, this is their first big event in Scotland ever. And so I kind of wondered if he watched, you know, it kicked off one o'clock our time, which would have been 11 o'clock California time. Yeah. Maybe he watched it. Could have been. Um, before we get too far into the match um, or even jump into the match at all, I do think we we probably should touch on uh, a little bit of a bummer of uh, a, a new story that broke um, during the current game or, or right before the current game on, on Friday. Uh, Sporting Kansas City midfielder. Felipe Hernandez has been placed on administrative leave. And there was just a very short statement that the league and sporting put out. It just says, it just says major league soccer has placed sporting Kansas city midfielder, Felipe Hernandez on administrative leave following a report. That the player violated the league's gambling policies, as well as the terms of his January, 2022 reinstatement. And just for those of you who may not remember, or who may be newer to sporting Kansas city fandom, Felipe Hernandez um, was suspended in October of 2021 for the remainder of the 2021 MLS season due to violation of the league's gambling integrity rules. He was reinstated in January 2022, subject to certain ongoing conditions, including continued abstinence from gambling. Um, and MLS and Sporting Kansas City said that they would ensure he received support and counseling as necessary. We never knew all of the details back then in 2021 when this happened. We did know that throughout much of the summer and fall of 2021, Felipe Hernandez was absent from the team. There was no reason given. Um, we found out when he was suspended in October of 2021 that it was basically insinuated that he had gotten himself in enough of a problem with some gambling debt that there were some concerns for his safety. And so the club and the league worked through that with him, got him to a point, obviously, where they felt he would be safe, uh, and then suspended him and reinstated him. Unfortunately, it seems like I, we have no information about how he was gambling, whether it was through legal means, because sports, sports gambling is legal in Kansas, whether it was through legal means or not, etc. The league, the club, everybody has no commented, anybody who's tried to get any more information. It is very tight-lipped. Uh, but it does seem that Felipe Hernandez, unfortunately, is dealing with what is a serious addiction and a gambling addiction. That's that's no one's officially used that term, but it would stand to reason that that is what's going on here. And I don't know, man, I would be surprised if we ever see Felipe um, honestly in an MLS game ever again, let alone a sporting Kansas City shirt at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's first and foremost, it's a sad deal. I mean, you can berate the young dude all you want, but uh Clearly, this is a problem. Anyone who ever, who's ever struggled with any kind of addiction, a drug, alcohol, gambling, like gambling's a real addiction. Um, mm -hmm. dude, sex is a real addiction. Like, it's it's a thing. There's all and, four uh, addictions, yeah. Yeah, and, and you don't know how to deal with it if you've never dealt with it. So, like, I, I don't gamble. I can't even begin to understand how hard that is to quit. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he must have got in. He's in deep, man. We remember him talking about how you know, he feared for his life at times. And it's like, mm -hmm. whoa, dude, like this is some serious, like underground, like bootleg gambling shit. This isn't DraftKings trying to come break your legs. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there, there are ways to do it that are are legal and safe and whatnot. And, you know, I've I've done a little bit of sports gambling through through the legal apps in, in oh, Kansas. Shit, are you OK? <laughs> I, but knowing my my personality and how I am. I just also know that, like, I've had to set limits that, like, I stick to pretty inherently, like, I'm not making fifty dollar bet. I, the bets I'm making are like a dollar, two dollars, really? and 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 it's and I also you know I when it started getting legal in Kansas, they had all sorts of promos where they're like, you know, bet five dollars, get two hundred dollars instantly or whatnot. So and and that's how they get you is people think, oh, this is easy, I can make a lot of money, and then you get that dopamine rush where you're like, sure. I just won money, cash money, and then when you lose it, it's like. 
all it takes is one more hit for me to make it all back. And that's how you get in this cycle of just one more bet and suddenly I'm even again. And it keeps continuing to spiral until you find yourself in an unfortunate situation. Uh, my wife had to break me in, in Vegas, dude. I, I can, I'm like, I'm going to do $100, going to go play blackjack. It'll probably last five minutes. We'll see what happens. And I, you know, I was there for a bit and I was like, I'm going to the ATM. And she's like, really? Like, like and I was like, <laughs> no, and she, she let it happen. She's like, all right, let's do this again. You know, we, we have the money. We saved for this. It's fine. But let's, we're done after that. And then when I lost that, I was like, should have quit when I was ahead, man, because I, I was up like $100 at one point. Right. But you can see how if you have so, that sort of addictive personality, how you're yeah. like, oh, I was up. All it takes what? is a, Bro. a couple of hits my way and I'm right back there. And suddenly you find yourself hundreds or thousands of dollars in debt. Full transparency. That's why I had to quit drinking because I would create uh, alcoholic uh, uh, routines. Mm-hmm. I, if it was, if it was a, if I'm watching a football game, I would drink about five beers during a football game. It was crazy. I would have no mean- problem taking shots of whatever, and I was like, "This, this is now a problem." No one mm-hmm. told me. I just had to realize it. So, well, and that's the thing is typically with with addiction, whether it is drugs or drinking or gambling or sex or whatever. Like it's not like as it's happening that you're 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 realizing, hey, this is the next step of addiction. Hey, this is the next step of addiction. Suddenly you're just at a point where you're like, holy shit, I have a problem. Or someone has to tell you, holy shit, I you have a problem. Yeah. There's people listening and right now that are like five beers during a football game, fucking novice. (laughs) Sure. And it's different for everybody. Sure, of course. Some people may be able to crush five beers during a football game and then not drink the entire week until that and like and that's manageable. And then for other people, they might be like, I that can't handle it. That's too much. It's different. I didn't like it enough. You know what I mean? I'm, I just I was just doing it to do it and get yeah. drunk. And it's like, well, that's a problem. Yeah. So anyway, um, it, this is a bummer. We don't know anything more as of the time of this recording. We're probably not going to know anything more for a while. Um, maybe ever. Maybe ever. Uh, my guess is, like I said, Peter did talk about in, in January of 2022 when Felipe was reinstated, he talked about how he believes in second chances and how he wanted to give a young, talented player a second chance. Does he believe in thirds? <laughs> he had that second <laughs> chance. And, and you know, like we said, addiction is a, is a real thing. It, I'm not going to sit here and blame Felipe. I feel sad for him. I feel like, was it, is this a missed opportunity? Yes, but there we don't know all the extenuating circumstances. I think we both and, and everybody hopes that he gets the help he needs and we probably won't see him in in a professional soccer jersey again at least at this level uh He's but also a good player you know mm-hmm. well and that's the thing too that you know bef- before we jump to our break here in, in a little bit and then and then hit the game there is not to be insensitive but but there also is a soccer impact to this for sporting kansas city uh, with the way injuries have gone and with the way this season has gone sporting kansas city is currently relatively thin at the midfield position and with the news that Felipe Hernandez was placed on administrative leave that left Sporting Kansas City with as of the Galaxy game three healthy midfielders on the roster Eric Tommy, uh, Nemanja Radia and Memo Rodriguez those are the starting three midfielders right now those are the only three midfielders available that aren't out with injury because Remy Voltaire um, is out with injury and uh, and the, uh, the um, other midfielder whose name just escaped me. I'm blanking on it. Um, it, he is uh, Danny Flores. He is um out with an injury as well. So, um, this is not a great thing from a soccer perspective for Sporting Kansas City either. So it's uh, I don't know that it necessarily changes the outlook for the summer transfer window. But but now what at one point could have been considered a position of depth is certainly a position of need for Sporting KC. Yeah, so, sure is. It's just unfortunate, but hopefully he gets the help he needs. And if there are more developments, you know, we'll uh, we'll we'll bring him to you. But as of now, um, you know, just just thoughts with Felipe and and his safety. So yeah, I hope he's just not like. You think he's just in like casual conversations with people, and like something will be said, and he'll be like, "Want to bet?" And they're like, "No, no, Felipe, <laughs> no." Well, no, they don't. There was uh, someone made a comment. Uh, Mo Edu uh, was was the color commentator on uh, the the Galaxy game. And at one point, it's just a colloquialism. He didn't mean anything by it. It was a total mistake. But at one point, he said something like, "Sporting Kansas City needs to be willing to gamble a little bit more here." And people were like, "No, wrong phrase." <laughs> nice. They really jumped on that, huh? Yeah. 
So anyway, uh, let's let's jump to our break here, and then when we come back, we'll talk more about the Galaxy game. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest-ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. kcsn.substack.com What is up? It's Tucker Franklin here to tell you about our friends at PXG. And as a golfer for years, I've been hearing PXG say, nobody makes golf clubs like we do, period. And you know what? I got to say that they are right. I went in for a fitting and I got to see firsthand for myself. I went and swung the new PXG Black Ops driver and it is a total game changer. You no longer have to sacrifice distance for forgiveness. That is absolutely huge. And no matter how good the tools getting fitted can take your game to a whole new level. And look, they'll even give you a dozen of golf balls for free just for going and doing it. It's the world-class team of PXG experts will analyze every aspect of your swing with every club and give you feedback in real time how to improve. I went in there, got set up with Alex. She looked at my swing, fixed a couple swing things, but ultimately using the technology of the PXG and the Black Ops driver helped exponentially increase my game, added 50 yards to my drive, added more consistency with my shots, less disparity. It was an absolutely huge game-changing experience. If you're thinking PXG's high-performance equipment is too expensive, Their clubs often cost less than the so-called leading brands. Here's what you got to do. PXG made me a believer, and they'll do the same thing for every golfer in Kansas City. Visit pxg.com slash KCSN soccer to schedule your fitting at PXG Kansas City. That's 7517 West 119th Street in Overland Park. Get fitted for any club, and you'll get a dozen golf balls for free. That's pxg.com slash KCSN soccer to schedule your fitting. pxg.com slash KCSN soccer. Limit one dozen golf balls per person. Promotion ends June 30th. Other terms and conditions may apply. See store for details. Let me tell you this. Uh, saw the new Bad Boys movie this week. Oh, yeah. And it did not disappoint, my friend. I was okay. very into it. Very entertained. I laughed. I was I was scared. I was like a villain. I was like, oh, my God, I hate this man. Yeah. Uh, I saw the villain uh, was in Grey's Anatomy, for God's sakes. He was a hunky doctor. And I'm like, well, let's see how this goes. I saw a pretty cool video of showing how they filmed some of the, the, the first person scenes with Will Smith with the gun and they had a camera rig that would like turn around. That was kind of cool. It was so. very cool. And I was waiting for that, that scene in the movie. And when it came, I was like, ah, dude, he like tosses a gun to Martin Lawrence and the camera goes with the gun. Yeah. It was pretty wild. Um, I have not seen any movies this week. Um, I've heard good things about Bad Boys. I've heard great things about Inside Out 2, which sure. just came out. So I want to see that. that. Probably emotionally destroy me like the first one did. But I hear I hear there's some cringe moments because it's more, you know, going through like puberty and stuff. And I, I'm like, well, if you're, you know, it's things we all went through. Right. It is what it is. It should make you cringe and feel weird. Yeah. No, the movies that I've been watching, I've been I've been at home more recently. So I just last night finished the watch through of all of the extended editions of the Lord of the Rings movies. Listen, so. I just started the Hobbit book today. The, the book. OK. Yeah. We read we, it before? No, we just finished the uh, the first five Percy Jackson books. Okay. And so we love those. And it's like, okay, we try to put a book in between a Percy Jackson book, mm-hmm. like to mm-hmm. trade off. And we're like, so we're going to do the Lord of the Rings and we're starting with the Hobbit. Yeah. And we're one chapter in and I'm just like, this is fantastical. Okay. <laughs> the The Hobbit book is one of my favorites. Our producer, Nick, also uh, uh, totally agree. He says the book is way better than the movies. I did rewatch the Hobbit movies recently uh, for the first time since I saw them in theaters. I liked them a little more watching them 10 years later. I was really pissed off at them the first time I saw them in theaters because I love that book so much. Um, the Hobbit book is is a great book. It's a little bit of an easier read than the Lord of the Rings books. Tolkien okay. gets a little bit... You have to get used to it because he'll spend like 20 pages explaining how you know hobbits make bread. But you'll get through that and like the world that he built. The, you, you've struck a nerd chord with me now and then we'll move on to soccer. But the, the the most interesting thing, and, and I think it's good to know this before you really jump into the world of Tolkien, is he was a linguist. He created the language of Elvish before mm-hmm. he wrote any of the books. So he built this language, and then he was like, I need an excuse to use this language. So then he created the world of The Hobbit and then subsequently The Lord of the Rings so he could be able to use the language that he created. Well, we have it on, on Kindle and uh, uh, occasionally when like the dwarves are singing a song or something, mm-hmm. there's a little icon you can press and it's it's Tolkien singing the song. 
That's awesome. It's really neat. And I was like, cool, I don't have to try to sing this song and guess what the melody is. Uh, but the way I remember a lot of movies in my life are playing the Lego video games. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, dude, we're talking from Star Wars to Harry Potter to Hobbit yeah. and Lord of the Rings. Like, I'm like, oh, I remember this part in the video game. I just installed Lego Hobbit on my computer, so I might have to to go through it. On man, yeah. we, we we got all that shit, dude. It's yeah. fun. Well, if you ever want to talk, if you have questions, oh boy, I could tell you. Did you watch the Rings of Power on Amazon? Oh yeah, I've been watching that. Not really following along on what's happening. It's just it's beautiful, and that gra- that grabs me. Oh boy, well. You've you've struck my 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 nerd chord. I know, I know. You ease up, clean up on aisle Jimmy <laughs> over here. Uh, let's let's talk this uh, this Sporting KC LA Galaxy game. Um, Why do we have to? I'm having so much fun. <laughs> Look at this is now a Lord of the Rings podcast. Damn. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing about this game is we knew that Daniel Shallow he was injured. He probably was not going, almost certainly was not going to be playing. So we knew we were going to see some. Uh, rotation on the front line with Alenis Vargas, which we did. Alenis Vargas started in place of Daniel Shallowy. We knew the midfielders that were going to play. And uh, there was a little bit of a surprise on the back line. Um, it, it made sense once I saw it, but Kyrie Shelton was starting, excuse me, at right back. And I think um, it it became pretty clear that that was because they needed Jake Davis as potential midfield depth. There just are no other midfielders. There, I mean, Marino Janis could play midfield, but he's he's not a natural midfielder. And then Tim Leibold. Was, Especially with Felipe gone, you know? Right, exactly. And then Tim Leibold was uh, was put on the bench in place of, of Zoran Basong, and that could just be a uh, performance issue. So, interesting. Hey, happens to the best of us. Yeah. So um, we did get some good news. I mean, we had talked about last week, at least for me, the, the player I was most concerned about for the LA Galaxy was Ricky Pooj. And then he was listed as questionable two days before the game, and then he was not available for the Galaxy this game, and he's arguably the best player not named Lionel Messi in MLS. So, but okay, no Ricky Pooch. This might have gotten a little bit easier. And, uh, I mean, it looked from the get-go like the Galaxy were on the front foot and, and Sporting was just somewhat overwhelmed. Um, it took them a while to finally break through and get a goal, but... It seemed pretty apparent from right off the bat that Sporting Kansas City were the lesser of the two sides here in this game. I don't know if you got that feeling too, but that's that's how. I mean, yeah, I mean it. Uh, uh, God, dude, that first goal came what at the end of the first half, mm-hmm. like five minutes left. Yeah, but it had. Oh my God, Tim Melia was just a monster. Super on human. His goal. He blocks it. Boom, gets back up and gives it a big bear paw and blocks it again. And the defenders are just watching Tim. Like mm-hmm. you're doing great, Tim. Like they're not getting defenders. They're not coming to the goal to like defend the goal. They're not coming to the ball where Tim is at. Dude, you know what I think of in this situation? I think it translates to football. When there is a fumble and your player, if your side, your player recovers the ball, Mm -hmm. you cover up your player Mm -hmm. so no one can get in there and strip the ball from him or hurt him. Do crazy stuff on the bottom of the ball. Why is no one like covering Tim? Like there should be a circle of guys around him ready to either kick the ball away if Tim spills it out or or protect Tim from getting kicked. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Where that, dude? Like, Tim's got to be pissed in this moment, right? Well, and if you look at even before the shots, so Jovalich has the ball. He lays it off for, for Gabriel Peck. And as soon as Gabriel Peck gets the ball, Radia just kind of stops. Like, he just literally stops his run. Fonta stops his run a, mo- a few moments before then. But, but Gabriel Peck gets the handoff. Radia stops his run. Jovalich, or excuse me, uh, Gabriel Peck gets his first shot off. Tim blocks it. And that's where it's Zoran Basong and Kyrie Shelton are standing there. And none of them move as Jovalich goes right by. Hits another shot. Tim blocks it again, like you said. And then there's a third time and Tim's diving as best as he humanly possibly can. And Jovalich finally puts it away. And it's Kyrie Shelton and Zoran Basong at this point who are the two closest. None of the other four guys around are doing anything either, but those are the two closest, and they simply are just standing there watching Tim dive for his life, and Tim gets up the second the ball goes in, and he throws up his arms, and he's like, what are you all doing? You just let just, me here. Just hang out to dry, man. I, I, When you come up like a beast like that, and, and, and then something like that happens, it's it's got to feel like you guys quit on me. 
like, fuck you, I'm on an island back here. I'm already not integrated into the team because I'm back here and can't really like hang out with you guys. So glad to know y'all have my back. Well, and that's just, that's what I imagine is so frustrating because Tim is the type of player, whenever you talk to him in a post game, he's never going to put blame on other people. Like whenever there's something, when even if it's like pretty obviously not Tim's fault, his his go to response is always, "I got to do better. I can do more as a leader. I can do more. Whether it's communication, whether it's being more on my toes, whatever. This is a team game. That's on me. So this was obviously an away game. We didn't get to talk to Tim after. I'm sure he would have said something along those lines. Uh, there's maybe once in his career I can think of when he he didn't even call anybody out by name, but he kind of was like, "We're not doing enough defensively." But this is one of those situations where I don't know how you as Tim Millia could look at that and be like, I didn't do my job because I sure as hell did my job. Y'all let me down. And then at the end of the day, also, I don't really care because it's LA Galaxy. Like, I kind of figured these guys were going to storm over us anyways. Mm-hmm. Like, they're legitimate contenders for the top of the freaking league. So they've, they've done a great job rebuilding their roster and getting back to where they once were. Um, so, I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, like, Whatever, man. Tim got screwed here by his own team, it feels like. But it's a goal and it's LA Galaxy, bro. So I'm not I'm not even mad. I'm still very comfortable saying no playoffs for us this year. <laughs> what? Breaking news. <laughs> I, I, I'm still that's still a thing. I'm still on that train. Uh I mean we went into the halftime break down one zero, which it felt like maybe that was a little fortunate because, you know, they they had uh, had a number of chances. They didn't have a ton of shots at halftime, but they had a number of chances. Um, and then, you know, again, it was, you know, just less than 10 minutes after the start of the second half, Gabriel Peck just runs by people, um, finds a hole in the back line. Um, Memo is, is far up the field. Fonte has to go run in. And then uh, Zoran Basong just doesn't really stick with, with Gabriel Peck. And he's able to get around Casty and put one past him. When it hit 2-0, you kind of felt like that's probably that. If it's a one goal game, maybe you think you can somehow fight back and get a draw. I, I felt pretty uh, pretty defeated at that point when it became two zero. Hundred percent, man. It just felt uh, like you're not coming back. And then we kind of squeeze one in. And it's like, oh, maybe there's hope here. I- yeah, it, 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 a free foot gave us a little bit of hope. Um, he checked in, and a minute after checking in. Eric Tommy really is is the one who does most of the work here. Drives to the end line, cuts it back, gorgeous pass, and the free foot does well to pass it in. So does his job. Like that's exactly how that should work. Mm-hmm. That's a bing bong boom, it, it, easy easy play. Yeah, and you know, to a free foot's credit, not all of the sporting forwards have been able to do their job in that situation this year. Very true. I mean, I <laughs> hey, I got stats later. I mean, we're gonna it's uh, I'm gonna talk about all that, but it's like, dude. Yeah. Also, Tim Milio was doing his freaking job this game from like 1v1 stops uh, uh, from just, I don't know, man, just quick, quick freaking saves. I was very impressed and uh, on his six saves of the night. Yeah, four four goals is not fair to Tim Milio. It's not fair because he saved six for God's sake. Right. He he had he had a, all things considered a, a pretty good game. So it's 2-1 at this point. And, and you know what? When I did... It reminded me, I think I even tweeted this out from the pod account at one point. This game reminded me a little bit of that, uh, like the kombucha girl meme gif where she's like, doesn't like it. And I was like, oh, wait a second. Maybe, no, maybe, nah. Like just keeps going back and forth. Yeah, it was the first time she tried kombucha was was what like that. Happening. I had no idea. Yeah. So it felt a little bit like, because immediately it was like, ah, oh, two down, like we're screwed up, oh, goal. And then the paint cell goal. And then Costi's goal. And then, ah, never mind. Um, Two one, as much as you know, moments ago I was just saying, I felt like it, that was it. Momentum started to shift towards Sporting a little bit, and it was when that's the, how it happens. It was when the subs came on. It was when Alan Polito left the game that suddenly it felt like life was brought into the attack. That is not how that should happen. Uh, and Jake Davis came on at halftime for Alinus Vargas, who did nothing. Alinus Vargas getting a start because, hey, you had a great game last week. Let's let's reward you and have you start the game. And it's like, wait, you're not really anything to us. Like, I, wh- maybe you're just a sub, dude. Like, but Jake Davis coming on, that changed things. J- and and Peter had nothing but great things to say about Jake Davis after Good. the game. 
And he had to get a little yellow card at the end of the game, too. Literally two minutes left or some shit, and he gets a yellow card. And I'm like, no, this man will accumulate these things. Yeah. I mean, he he was asked specifically about what was the improvement in the second half. And he goes, I think the change was Jake Davis. Jake brought a lot of energy. He was great in the midfield uh, with his pressing. He was injecting life into the team. And all of a sudden, we started stepping up higher and higher on the field because there was a sense of urgency. Um, and then yeah, a lot of energy. There was even a follow-up question where someone asked about, well, what about Afrifa and Agata? It seemed like there were more chances once they came in, and and he turned it back to Jake again. He was like, yeah, there was a sense of urgency, but like I said, Jake was a big part of that because Jake was the one pushing the team. That's fine that he wants to build up Jake, but also he doesn't want to tear down his multi-millionaire, uh, you know, Alan Polito. Designated player that you just signed through a contract extension for another two seasons after this year. Exactly. He can't be like, yeah, these strikers that came on were great. And then that implies that the striker that was on was not great. Well, you know, I saw there was a, a video on MLSsoccer.com where the title was something along the lines of like, does Sporting Kansas City need to rebuild or whatnot, which I think we all know. Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. But yeah. but they were talking, I think it was Moa Du talking with um, Taylor Twelman in there and uh, Bradley Wright Phillips and uh, um, Adu and, and BWP were saying that the issue with sporting, which we all know, is that the front three that are the typical starters, Shally, Polito, and Johnny Russell, they're not cutting it. When we played Seattle last week, Raul Rui Diaz independently on his own had more goals than those three players combined this year, which is not acceptable. And so he was saying, well, perhaps we need to start seeing more is even if Alenis Vargas is having a rough half or whatnot. The front three that is the typical starters aren't doing it anyway. So at what point do you continue to, or, or, or do you keep starting those those quote unquote star players because they're the ones making four million dollars a year and are designated players? Or at what point do you say this is truly an open competition and we're not going to just put players in there because of the label attached to them? And I'm sure Peter Vermees would say it's always an open competition, best players going to play, etc. But I, also, man, you, you just signed someone to a $4 million DP deal. I'm sure there's some pressure to play him. And Alan Polito was not playing like a $4 million designated player. No, he's not. And it's sad, man. Like, we thought he was our our uh, great Latino hope. You know what I mean? It just uh, did not work out that way right now. It's weird. It's just he looked last year. And, you know, this is, I think, about the closest, the closest sort of like analogous coach I can think of to Peter Vermees. We've talked about this a little bit before was when Bill Belichick was with the Patriots. He had GM duties. He was coach duties. He was an old school coach. He had been with them for a long time, had a lot of success early on. Well, throughout his career, really. But something that that Belichick, I remember, his philosophy was, was more along the lines of he would always rather get rid of someone a year too early than a year too late. Um, and, and he even tried to get rid of Tom Brady earlier than they did get rid of Tom Brady. Uh, but it's crazy, right? right? Stopped him. And I almost feel like Peter's the opposite in that sense. Peter tends to hold on to players a year or two too long as opposed to letting somebody go a little bit too early. And I feel like Alan Polito is maybe a prime example of that where people were worried before he re-signed last year. He's getting a little older. He's had two major knee injuries. Yeah, he had a good year last year and he looked better after the surgery, but is that indicative of what's to come? He was signed to one of the bigger deal sportings in case he's ever signed a player to, and now look where we're at it's yeah. just sometimes you got to cut bait and not not make um decisions that you're going to regret later and tie you you know a, a poor decision for a couple of years but it is what it is um you know blowing through some of these last goals i mean it, this it was really this third goal for for the galaxy that was the backbreaker i know casty ends up scoring off of this set piece later but <clears throat> willie agata I don't know what Willie Agat is trying to do here on this turnover. He tries to get real cute. He tries to do a little back heel to Eric Tommy instead of just either passing it to Tommy normally or holding up play like he should be able to do and it should be a good part of his game. He does this cute little back heel. It gets turned over. The Galaxy fire it on the counter real fast. Gabriel Peck is flying down the left side. Uh, paint sills wide open in the middle, taps it in, and that was... That was ball game right there. That's where all momentum died. And yeah, it really started with Willie Agata trying to be fancy where he didn't need to be. Try to do a little fanciness and then boom, the defenders are just 
caught off their line, man. And now it's like you got three Galaxy players right there ready to just put it in the back of the net. And right. Painsel is such a good player that this goal was way too easy for him because he's created harder shit than this. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah. And he stays on sides, gets that pass beautifully, and Tim's just Tim's just screwed. All he can do is yell at his defenders again. Right. And and honestly, it's not even really the defender's fault at that point because the yes, as a defender, you want to be ready for a counter at any given point. But but also you kind of have to take into account the game states. When when you have pos- possession the way they did, you're not expecting such an easy, cheap turnover from your midfield or from your no. forwards. And when that happened, and Peck just sprinted down the left side and it was a perfectly placed switch over the top long ball by the Galaxy. I mean, that's all on Willie. Well, not long after that, Tim makes an amazing save one-on-one versus Paintsol. And then uh, in the 80th minute, their goalkeeper makes a great save, mm-hmm. which the, the broadcaster was just like, that's probably save of the year. And I'm like, I highly doubt that. I had a long with these broadcasters. It was a great save. Who was it? Was it Was it Callum? It was Keith Costigan in Moedil. Keith Costigan. Okay, but he, he was British, right? So it sounded like yeah. Callum, maybe. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And it just, I was like, save of the year? What are we doing? Yeah. What, are we, what are we gassing up the galaxy here like that for? Like, Well, they, they, they were gassing up. The, I thought it was a galaxy broadcast. They brought on two former galaxy players. Now, the Robbie Rogers one, I get. Robbie, it, it was a Pride Night match at the LA Galaxy. Robbie Rogers was the first um, openly out gay active MLS player. When he came out back in the mid uh, 2010s, you know, 2015, 2016, when he was playing for the Galaxy. So they brought him on to talk about that as part of Pride Night. I understand it. They kept him on mid game for like 10 full minutes. It was a long time. And then they brought on another former Galaxy player that had nothing to do with anything, where they were just talking about the Galaxy. And I was like, what? I thought Apple was supposed to be neutral. What is happening? No, definitely not neutral. Uh, I mean, you could say that same thing whenever. Maybe Bukati is on the call for us. You know what I mean? We we know he's been a long time sporting fan, but he's so rarely on the call. And they don't bring like last. You know, Drew Vanderplug pointed out he was like, to be fair, they had Buzio on the call last week against Seattle, which true, but also the Olympic team was in town and he's part of the Olympic team. That made more yeah. sense. Like I said, the Robbie Rogers right. stuff, I get it. The 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 second player was like, at this point, what now? We've done like twenty minutes of game time just talking to old Galaxy players. Well. I'm going to lead you into this here because I think it's time to break out uh, a little toast here. But this next goal, man, Castellanos, getting on the end of this uh, Mm -hmm. uh, set piece here. Beautiful ball from Johnny. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't really score set piece goals, so this felt awesome. And Castellanos just played it off at the end of the game. Was like, I, I, uh, this is training ground stuff. We do this in training. I'm like, well, we've never seen it before, so bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) And. uh, but then he, he, he gets, a, gets a foot on it. It bounces right past the keeper. The keeper's like, I don't even know what just happened. And then he gets in this guy's face mm-hmm. and like chest bump this dude. And I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's go. Team bad boys. Mm-hmm. Let's fight. I like Cassie. Uh, he's he's yeah. turning into a little bit of a bash brother. Like we said last week when, when uh, Johnny got in a little bit of a, a, a tussle and Castellanos ran from the bench all the way out to where it was. And when we asked him about it post game, he was like, if your guy's in a fight, sometimes you got to fight with them. Listen, if you're going to, dude, if we're not going to win games, let's kill them all. <laughs> let's just, let's just fight. Like, that's what I'm down for. I mean, it's, it's like the mighty ducks, dude, when they're that's so weird. bad to start. So they, they just start picking fights and like faking injuries and stuff. Let's yeah. go full in bash brothers. <laughs> um, it was cool for, for Castellanos too, cause he is from the LA area. He got to play yeah. in front of his family. He got to score the goal in front of his family. So I think you're right. I think. For that, and he made honestly, he made a couple of great defensive runs that that um, and some perfectly timed tackles that kept this game from potentially getting worse. So I say, Holiday Distillery, toast to the match, Castellanos. Uh, this is for you. Congrats on the goal. Congrats on scoring in front of your family. Um, proud of you for that. No, the result didn't go the way you want. And honestly, we talked to him after. He was the only player we got to talk to in the post game, and he was appreciative that we asked him about the goal in front of his family. But he was like, "But you know what." That's not what's important tonight. We needed to get a team result. That's what I want to focus on. He's just a, a total professional. So, Holiday Distillery yeah. toasts the match to Robert Castellanos. Good job, Robert. Uh, not long after that goal, man, Tim Milia has to come up very good again against mm-hmm. Hainsel. Like a one-on-one, one-handed, like drop to his side. Uh, but then 
just they seal it. They, you know, you have a little hope. You're entering the 90th minute. You're like, we just need to steal one goal, right? It's five mm-hmm. minutes of stoppage time. And they they seal the deal, get another yeah. goal. Miguel taps one in. And what's so frustrating about this goal to me is you see Zoran Basong shoulder check him. I'm looking right now. Three yeah. different times. Literally three independent times he shoulder checks. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Okay, so he's got his eye on him. And then he just somehow in the next one and a half seconds forgets that he's there and doesn't run with him at all. And it's, again, the world's easiest tap. And, and you can see how mad Tim is where he jumps up and he like punches the air. And he, I mean, again, it's, it's not on Tim. Crazy. He's got an eye on him. And he's like, cool, I'm well aware of where you are. And then it's like, That's no, you're two more not. times. Yeah. He literally does it three times. You're there. Okay. You're there. Okay. You're there. I mean, okay. Miguel just and, burns him. I don't know what happened. He turns in that door and just forgets he's there. <laughs> just like, what is happening? Just bizarre, man. I'm ready to put this one away because guess what? The freaking thing does not get easier. We got RSL Wednesday, Columbus on Saturday. Jesus Christ. What are we doing? I don't want to, I don't want to play anymore. I don't want to do this. Uh, it's not, it's not great. Um, you want me to hit you with some, with a little segment we're going to start doing here, I think? Hit me. Because McKinnon Walsh, a longtime listener of ours, had a great name for this segment. It's called Chip the Keeper of Stats. <laughs> we were kinda, I was kind of throwing it around there. My buddy Chip is a big stats guy. Uh, he's kind of like our phantom correspondent here. Mm-hmm. And he just blows up my text, man. And I'll just read this stuff to my, the best of my ability. Uh, his takes on things and some numbers. He thinks we're the kind of team that needs to hit rock bottom if we're ever going to have a come to, coming to Jesus moment. You know, like if we finish in a bad spot, we kind of want the fans to write something about it, about how this has to change, about how we feel disrespected and unheard, how we are a joke to the whole league. Um, other teams have been wondering why PV is still there. You know, it isn't just an SKC thing if freaking Cincinnati fans are asking about it. <laughs> um, we're close to getting a damn wellness check from San Jose. <laughs> So SKC struggled last night, except for a few moments where things clicked. Dropping this game means that Sporting KC has 0.6 points per game from the last five games and are needing 1.88 points per game for the rest of the season to hit that 44 points magic number we spoke about. Problem is that our next game up is against Salt Lake, who is sitting at 1.8 points per game in the last five games and is sitting at first in the West. We're playing at home, so meh. Not that the home field advantage is immensely helpful to us, as Sporting has two wins, three draws, and four losses at home this season. This goes up against an RSL team that had three wins, six draws, and one loss away. Fair to say we're going to give up points this game. But this team is going up against a Salt Lake team with Arango, who has more goals by himself, 16, than all of Sporting Kansas City's forwards at 15. Uh, stats for the last episode haven't changed all that much, but now that Afrifa got his goal last night, he now jumps to second highest goals per 90 minutes with 0.54, which is right okay. behind uh, Vargas at 0.7. Okay. Keep in mind, some platers like Vargas, Afrifa, Chinese have fewer than 300 minutes played, so some of those goals per 90 are going to vary, just like the god of soccer himself, Ben Bender, who's at 5.63 goals per 90. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I would note that, quite honestly, shocked me is that SKC has scored 28 goals this season, which is tied for ninth in the league and beating out teams that have double our points for the season. So while we're in a position where the goals aren't coming from the places we'd expect, the goals are coming. Problem being, we're second to last in terms of goals allowed for the season, only beating out San San Jose, who are racing us for the wooden spoon this year. Mm Mm-hmm. Sporting has some issues with getting serious productivity out of the attack, with only 54% of our goals coming from the attack and 18% coming from defenders. Jake Davis has two. Rosero has two. Castellanos now has one. It's crazy, man. We're not getting forwards to score goals. No. Chip, thanks so much for that information, man. Uh, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy reading all that shit. Uh, he's doing the hard work for us, man. I love it. Chip the keeper. Chip the keeper of stats. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, he's right. The, 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 there are goals that are coming, weirdly. Um, it's just that we're still significantly outperforming what our uh, expected goals should be. Um, you know, our, our expected goals on the year is 20.7. 
Um, and the actual number of goals that we've scored, this was um, before the game yesterday, I think, is, is 28. So, you know, this is... Um, oh, no, that is up to date. Um, we're outpacing by nearly eight full goals on the year, what should be expected. And like you said, it's because we're not getting anything from the attack. We're not getting those runs into the box. You look at what the Sounders did last week, or you look at what the Galaxy did last week, when they have the ball in the attack, they're having staggered runs into the box. They're having two, three players in, in various different layers in the box creating an attack. And sporting, how many times do we see a ball whipped across into the box and there's maybe one person there, but there's nobody at the back post? It's just, there's there's nothing in the final third. And that goes back to, like you said, the forwards aren't finishing. It's like what Moadu pointed out, that uh, Raul Rui Diaz had more goals than all three of our forwards combined. It's the same thing with Chicho Arango coming up this week. It's just, the attack is not good enough. And the defense yeah. has had too many lackluster mistakes. It goes back to what we said before. Unless this team is perfect, it cannot win games. Yeah. So, it is, it is where it is. And it leaves, like you said, Sporting Kansas City... Uh, second to last place um, in in the Western Conference, uh, 14 points just ahead of San Jose, um, who are on 11 points. But San Jose also has a game in hand. Um, and at this point, the next two teams above Sporting Kansas City, Dallas and St. Louis, also have a game in hand. So Sporting Kansas City starting to find themselves deeper and deeper in that hole. So this is rough. Um, it is rough. Um, one bit of interesting tidbit that doesn't have anything to do with the game really but I've, I've made a couple of tweets about how i thought the broadcast was not the most fair and it was pretty galaxy heavy like we had talked about sounders fans got weird about it sounders fans got in my mentions and were saying no kansas city fans are upset or crying or triggered or whatnot i was like you guys have a game that's actively happening right now i didn't yeah. say anything about the sounders and you're over here talking about sporting like dude what are that? So that's why I just, in reply to one guy, I simply just put up the video of Melia rock bottom and Christian rolled on, and they didn't like nice. So, yeah, of course they didn't like that, I, <laughs> dude. Those are the kind of people that like that that have nothing better to do but like watch other people instead right. of worried about your own people. Uh, like people that, dude. I stop sometimes. I stumble into the comments and I just read, and then I'm out there. I'm out of it immediately because it's not a fun place to be. Like. These these ugly freaking men were just like, oh, Brittany Mahomes is a Midwest oh, five at God. best. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you, you think you're God's gift to women? Like, it's <laughs> always this it's always this like nasty looking guy thinking he has the right to judge anybody. And now I'm no better than him because I'm judging him. I, I just I, I fell into the trap. I think people people just got to worry about themselves. Yeah, that's really absolutely. What it comes I just get so mad. I'm like, bro. First of all, she's not Midwest Five. You got your goddamn mind. You know what I mean? <laughs> she's up there, and 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 it's the fact of the matter is, why are we even talking about how people look in the first place? Who gives a shit? People are wild. People just clearly Sounders fans had sporting on the mind after last week. So yeah, like my watch your own freaking game, dude. I'm sorry we looked grass last. Currently week. happening. Like yes, yeah, sorry we had to beat that ass. Uh, unfortunately, we did beat the Sounders, but that's uh. Sporting's lone win in the last 12 matches. So, and like I said, what? next two games, home against RSL, and then on the road against defending champions Columbus. Uh, RSL, very good team. We went and played them pretty close. In oh, pretty close, wasn't it? I believe we have a picture of you uh, looking like you had a great time. <laughs> in Salt Lake, I was there. It should, it should have arguably been points for Sporting Kansas City, and, and it wasn't. So now, you know, they're coming into Children's Mercy Park. And in terms of previewing this thing, I guess it's the same thing like we've been saying for, you know, each of the past however many weeks. There's simply no indication from this club that there's any reason to believe they can beat the first place team in the West. No, we'll just... That sucks. We'll just take it. We'll take our uh, take our lumps. Go ahead and give it to us, RSL. Columbus, too. Hey, we'll see you Saturday because uh, both of you are pretty good teams, so... We'll just we'll, we'll just be your punching bags. Well, I mean, Columbus this year, you know, they've they've had a little bit of a weird schedule because they made it all the way to the Concacaf Champions Cup final, sure. and and obviously they didn't end up winning that. But um, they're yeah, still they have like three games in hand on people, four on Miami. Right They they still have a, a number of games to make up because the schedule got got all all sorts of wonky. Um, but even still, 
They have four games in hand on Miami. They have three game, two or three games in hand on most everybody else, and they're still sit comfortably in a playoff spot. They're, I, I, dude, you can't ask for much better than that. It's like, okay, so we're not at the top of the league, but we were in Champions Cup for God's sakes. The travel, the the body exertion, like we're in a good place, right? Yeah, if they were to win the four games that they have in hand against Miami, they'd be first place in the East. So you know, That's it's wild. it's within reach for them. That's a very good team. RSL is a very good team. Both of them are coming off a result this week, too. So Cincinnati about to jump Miami here pretty soon, though. I think Cincinnati's one of the best teams, maybe the best team in the league. Uh, on Miami, as they middle. are. Oh, sure, yeah. But they you know, they have two games in hand on Miami, and I think that uh, once they play those, man, we might see them leap up there. Since he's definitely a, a more balanced team than Miami. Miami's got, you know, Messi and friends, the, the, sure. the superheroes. The star but, power, man. Right, but, but since he has, you know, not to say they don't have some stars with you know Lucho Acosta or whatnot. Uh, Matt Biazga, I think, actually got stretchered off their game, so hopefully he's doing okay. But uh, they are a balanced team that is consistent um, and doesn't rely on Lionel Messi or you know Sergio Busquets or Jordi Alba or, or Luis Suarez to to have a game for them to win. So exactly, um, I will say, man, it's not outside the realm of possibility that Sporting could sneak into a playoff spot. Obviously, the possibility is still there, but I'm so like so negative about it right now i just don't see any way how that can happen yeah i mean i think at this point we've been saying this for a little bit most likely chance of hardware is u.s open cup um yay we're still in that we're still in that quarterfinal uh you know but um it's coming up people still you know i went on a galaxy podcast this week people asked me is peter vermees on the hot seat is he gonna get fired we talked about this last week he's not they said as much that seat is ice cold He's, they, they seem like they're giving him at least three transfer windows. Uh, now, Daniel Sperry did have sort of a follow-up article in the Kansas City Star um, where he talked with uh, Peter Vermees about the transfer window. Um, and, and Peter said, I want to be active. I want to be for sure. Um, apparently, Peter said that uh, there were four deals for a DP caliber midfielder that fell through before this season started. So I took that as four potential, four different players that they were trying to get. It could have been, you know, a deal fell through for a player. They came back, thought they were close again. Another deal fell through for the same player. But um, four potential DP caliber players that did not come through. But Peter, he was pretty open about what what the team needs. He goes, quote, I think we need a central midfielder. We need an attacking midfielder for sure. Still a position of needs, but there are other places that we can also improve. Um, And then they went on to say that they really need to add players on all three lines, including striker and winger and defense. So um, in terms of adding a player, specifically an attacking midfielder, quote, I'd like to, Vermees said, but I can't tell you it's going to happen that way. And here's the part that stuck out to me. I'm still working with ownership on a budget for that position. So yes, we're about a month away still, but I'm doing a little bit of reading between the lines here, reading some tea leaves. It sounds to me like ownership on one hand is saying, we believe Peter's the right guy. We haven't been active enough. We need to be more active and Peter's the right guy to do it. And then I have Peter over here who, through some of the quotes that he's had over the past couple of, you know, two, three press conferences talking about transfer window budget has basically implied he's not getting the answer he wants to get or really any clarity from ownership on what I can actually go spend. And now we're, sure, a month still before the transfer window, but you kind of got to know what you're working with so the scouts can go out there and know what level of player am I allowed to scout. If I'm spending all my time scouting Antoine Griezmann and Griezmann saying, yes, there's interest. I'm not saying this is happening, but I'm just, you know, there's interest there. And we're, okay, we found somebody, we're good, all that. And then ownership's like, eh, we don't want to pay that much. Well, then you've wasted yeah. your whole time. So that's part of it. It feels like there is still, to me, uh, a, a bit of apathy or latency in terms of how invested is ownership in really seeing this project through. And if you're going to stick behind Peter and you think Peter's the guy, then give him all of the resources he needs to succeed. And if he can't do it, then you have your answer. Mm -hmm. If you say Peter's the guy, but you're not going to give him the resources that you need to give him to even see if he can be the guy, 
then we're just making the situation worse and we're staying exactly where we are. Oh yeah. hundred percent. That's frustrating. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, he, he ended he basically, Peter said, quote, you might have to sort of defer just because of the financial aspect, the timing and how all that stuff works. So attacking a midfielder is for sure the target. If it happens, I can't tell you if it does or not, but we need players on all three lines for sure. That just doesn't sound to me like a coach who's confident they're going to be able to add the players they want to. It sounds like a coach who's saying, this is what I want to do, and I don't think I'm going to have the money to do it. But yeah, that's exactly. a bummer. Doesn't give sporting fans a lot of confidence. So um, before we move on and, and maybe just touch on some some outside of MLS stuff real quick, do you have anything else you want to say about sporting or, or where things are at? No. Salt Lake coming up? Absolutely not. I don't even want to get on here and talk sporting with you right now. Like, and it's nothing to do with you. I'm just like, uh, what do we probably talk Lord of the Rings? Um, anything at all. (laughs) Well, anything at all. Let's, let's talk briefly U S men's national team because they held Brazil to a one, one draw for the first time in the history of the U S playing in Brazil. And, uh, you know, Brazil, um, they shot more than the U S, um, the U S was coming off of an embarrassing five to one defeat to Colombia. Uh, but this was a, a good result to turn around on. You know, the U.S.'s one goal came off of a Christian Pulisic uh, free kick. Um, but Brazil, the roster that played, it was not, you know, B-team Brazil. This was real Brazil. Um, and so with Copa America coming up, with, you know, the U.S. playing Uruguay here in Kansas City, um, after being able to go toe to toe with one of the world's best teams and draw them for the first time in history, following up an embarrassing five to one loss. Does that give you any more hope or excitement about watching the U S play against some quality sides in Copa America? Because historically they've been able to beat up CONCACAF pretty well. And then they play the rest of the world and they're kind of mid it. I am excited. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, that Columbia loss, I mean, that that's unfortunate. I mean, if you look at rankings alone, us and Columbia are like together. Now they haven't had new FIFA rankings since like April. Sure. You know, I don't know how often those come out, but, uh, you know, according to these, Brazil was number f- five and we're number 11 and Colombia was 12. Mm-hmm. So to get beasted by a 12, but draw a five, uh, it just seems like they have some inconsistencies. They really need to work out. Um, or the ranking system is bullshit. <laughs> Probably both. Uh, both. Yeah. It, it, it was interesting that, you know, it, and I saw Matt Doyle say this, maybe getting blasted by Columbia was the best thing that could have happened to the team in a weird way. Not that you ever want to see it happen, but maybe it was a little bit of a wake-up call, both for the players and for Greg Berhalter. And then we yeah. talked about last week, Berhalter said that he thought his players disrespected both Columbia and the game because of how they played. Yeah. Uh, clearly, they played better against Brazil. One thing that is funny, um, Ronaldinho, who is you know, one of the most famous uh, um, players in the history of, of the Brazilian, uh, soccer federation. Um, he was, he was not happy with what happened in this game. Um, he went on Instagram and he put up a, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but he put up a, a, a post that said, that's it guys. That's it for me. This is according to Google translate. Cause it was in Portuguese. That's it for me. This is a sad moment for those who love Brazilian football. It's difficult to find the energy to watch this game. This is perhaps one of the worst teams in recent years. It has no respectable leaders, just average players for the most part. Uh, He goes on to say, I've never seen a situation as bad as this. The shirt lacks love, lacks determination, and most of all, football. I repeat, our performance has been one of the worst things I have ever seen. A shame. Therefore, I declare here my abandonment. I will not watch any Copa America game nor celebrate any victory. So, drawing the U.S. has broken Ronaldinho's fandom of this team. <laughs> Great. Glad we could do that to him. It's just, it's so, but I think that's also a little bit indicative of, like, what some of this means to these international fans in other countries compared to the U.S. Because here we lose 5-1 to Colombia. There's memes on Twitter. We all go on with our life. They draw the U.S. for the first time, and Ronaldo's like, I renounce my fandom. <laughs> well we're we're kicking off group play uh next sunday man usa is and the, the tournament itself uh kicks off with argentina and canada on thursday yeah uh i'm excited for this a lot of a lot of mls players called up uh mm-hmm. to be a part of this and it's gonna be a fun little competition and all these different teams we're not used to seeing all the time outside of Concacaf. yeah for sure should be fun so and it'll be a good test of 
the Greg Berhalter Experiment 2.0. Will it work heading into 2026 or will it not? We'll see. I'm in. I mean, they, these competitions, I become like the biggest American. <laughs> it's like, you know, face painted, war eagle. Ah! It, yeah. It's going to get crazy. I'm excited. Hey, if we can somehow make a run and pull it off, it'll be great. So I'll be excited. Yeah. And Absolutely. and we have the U.S. men's national team playing here on July 1st against Uruguay at, at uh, Arrowhead. So should That's be fun. Right. Very cool. Should be good. If you can get uh, press credentials, because uh, you were having some issues. <laughs> it did eventually work out after nice. literally two and a half months of back and forth with a lot of yeah. translating of emails. A lot of uh, Rosetta Stone purchasing. I, I was able to secure it. <laughs> because CONCACAF, they're used to dealing with people in, in North America who speak English. CONMEBOL is the South American Federation. They don't, there's no country, really, that speaks English down there. So yeah. their entire credential process was in Spanish. So I had to Google Translate the application process. And then when they initially denied me because of a misunderstanding of what they're asking. As you're American. They, the email they sent me was all in Spanish. So I reply in English and I kept replying in English. They kept replying in Spanish. And I was like, I don't, uh, it, it worked out. But one of you needed to change. One of you needed to change. Uh, well, it wasn't going to be that. I'll tell you that. It certainly wasn't going to be you either. Yeah. No. <laughs> you should have though. You should have Google translated your own emails and copy and pasted it, you know. It it all worked out eventually. It, what yeah. what actually worked out is when I told them I was like Concacaf has credentialed me, and they're like, okay, well, show us your Concacaf credentials, and then we'll believe you're an actual media person. Wow, unbelievable! <laughs> Prove it. Prove that you fucking matter. I literally had to send pictures of all my credentials and my Concacaf and my U.S. soccer credentials and everything. Be like, see? I'm can you put your Can you put your dog up as collateral? What the? Fu- <laughs> well, was, that's what they they wanted. They were like, we need to see your media identification from the organization you work for. And I was like, I don't have like we don't. Daniel Sperry doesn't have one from the star either. Cause I asked him, I was like, we don't have like IDs that say KC sports network or whatever. Right. I sent them the KC sports network website. That wasn't good enough. So you're like, here's <laughs> a, here's a picture with me and BJ. Uh, right. <laughs> I assure you, we know each other. My producer, Nick. So, <laughs> anyway, thank you all Classic. so much for listening. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, let us know uh, how you're feeling. Uh, I know we, we, we get emails all the time. Um, so email us northerpod at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at no other pod at Dan Cooser at JC Max zero three. You can send us messages there. Leave us a five star rating and review. Let us know uh, what you want us to talk about uh, on Apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure you check us out on YouTube KCSN soccer on YouTube or via the Kansas city sports network app. But until next time, he's Dan. I'm Jimmy. We'll catch y'all later. See ya. America. Fuck. Yeah.